All right, guys, just a friendly heads up. Tomorrow you have no vocab. There's no vocab. I'm not going to do a vocab quiz on four words, so just a friendly reminder, no vocab. Um, you do have a test on Thursday. You have your vocab, uh, your focus and your spice are due on Thursday as well. Uh, so please make sure tomorrow the goal is if I get where I need to be today, then tomorrow I can spend time helping you with your focus and spice tomorrow in class. As you can see, we did jump up on toughness of focus and spice. Focus, would we agree? Yes. So we're going to talk about it because that's what up. That's the structure you're going to see your focus is going from here on out. So uh, we're going to discuss that tomorrow. What do you got, Cynthia? Are you also doing that thing in the morning? Yes, I will be here in the morning for sure. All right. So on the top of your notes, you should have period three. You should have week eight because that's the week we're in. Please write next to period three, 600 to 1450. That is your date range. Keep in mind that you do need to know your date ranges for your AP exam, correct? Because sometimes it'll say period three. Sometimes it'll just give you a date range. You need to know both. And we now know how important that periodization is, correct? So, all right. So you shouldn't have to write any of this down at the moment. Okay, we know that Rome collapses. However, right before it collapses, it gets divided up into two sides by Diocletian, the eastern and the western. Which side is thriving? Eastern, eastern. eastern is thriving. You can raise your hand and tell me why eastern side is thriving. Nathan. Okay, well, you got to give me a little bit more. Why? They were closer to the Silk Road. There you go. They're running the Silk Road. Uh, Constantinople is going to be the busiest trading city in the world because of so much money going through, which is going to keep the East going. Now, you need to know that it is the Byzantine Empire that rises. Cynthia, what's your question, darling? Uh, could we also say that it was more organized because in the West they were having problems? With, like, the reason why it's more organized is because when there's more money, more people get involved. So that at the end of the day, as long as you know that. So you need to know that the Byzantine Empire, there's a couple things. Put a big star. They are the first Christian empire in the world. Okay? They are your first. They are located on the Bosporus, which is this term. You do need to know it's known as the Golden Horn. Okay? Where that is, it is that little strip of water between the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. It is also about a mile between Europe and Asia. So it is the perfect trade location. And that's the biggest thing you need to know. There's plenty of water access. There's plenty of land access. It is literally the perfect place. Okay? Huh? Uh, it depends on the spelling. Uh, it's a street name of There you go. Sure. All this... There you go. Yeah, there you go. What do you got, Annie? Uh, Asia, from Asia to Europe. It's that close. There's like three quarter mile bridge they built in order to span from continent to continent, which is pretty cool. That's just to show you how close it is. You need to know that the government style is called Caesaropapism. That is the government style. This is a test question, by the way. Okay? Caesaropapism is the belief that the king is not divine, which means he's not a god. However, he was given his position by divine authority. So, the king itself is not divine. He is not a god. But he was selected by God to rule. Because remember... If the king was a god, that would be a false idol, correct? And you're not allowed to have a false idol. So, the king is not a god, but he was chosen by God to rule. Now, this idea is going to be the foundation of every other Christian-based empire. However, when it's in the Byzantine, it's called Caesaropapism. When it's anyone else, it's called divine right which you're going to continue to see divine right, divine right, divine right for the next 700 years, or for 2,000 years. Uh, the Queen of England rules by... She literally believes God chose her to rule the world. Well, rule Britain, okay? That's what she believes, okay? So, 
You need to know, it's kind of a weird fun fact, but they actually genuinely care. You need to know that the Byzantine courts wore purple. Why purple? You can raise your hand. Annie. Okay, shows their monarchy, but why? Their royalty, but why, Colton? Yeah, it's only found in, like, Lebanon or something on a beach. It's a shell. You have to grind up. It's super, super expensive. So by having purple, it shows your wealth. That's why they wear it. Just be aware of that. Now, Justinian, he is the golden age of the Byzantines. Justinian is the golden age of the, Byzantine, uh, the Byzant Byzantines. He has a wife named Theodora. She is a test question, by the way. She was a prostitute, however, they get married, and she becomes the reason why he stays in power. You need to know that Theodora is the reason why Justinian stays in power. Now, why do you think Theodora is the reason why Justinian is super popular? Why, Emerson? It was because, was it because of um, conflict between the blue and the green, and she told her the science. So. Okay. We're going to simplify that because I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Okay. I think I know what you're talking about. Cynthia? Well, basically she convinced him not to like surrender and run away during like a couple of wars that were going on. Okay, and, and, she, um, and the fact that, keep in mind guys, she's a prostitute. We know what a prostitute is. You pay her for sex. Yes, that's a prostitute. Okay, she's a prostitute. Do you think she came from a wealthy family or a very poor family? Poor family. So, do you think when she became queen, do you think she turned her back on the poor or tried to help the poor? She tried to help the poor. So, because of Theodora, all the things Justinian was doing, she kept an eye out for the poor and kept advocating for the poor. So, the poor loved Theodora. They had major problems with Justinian at times uh, because it cost so much for the wages, wars, and all this stuff. But she was beloved because she loved the poor because she was poor. Okay? So, you do need to know that he built the Hagia Sophia, which is spelled right over here. He built the Hagia Sophia. Oh my God, awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. He built the Hagia Sophia, which is the largest church in Christendom. Like, apparently you guys had to learn, some of you had to do that yesterday. There you go. It's pretty cool. It's really beautiful. It's in... Uh, Istanbul today, and it's on my list to see before I die. However, it's not the best time to go to Turkey right now. Okay, so I will not be going anytime soon. You also need to know that he creates Justinian Code, which is the recodification of the 12 tables from 4,000 laws to 312 laws. So he creates the Justinian Code, which is the recodification of the 12 tables from 4,000 laws to 312. Well, that's what the 12 tables are. I mean, that's what the Justinian Code is. Yeah. It has the dialects, it has, dialects. Uh, and all that stuff. It's all the different components of the different aspects <laughs> of law, like how to defend, how to do that stuff, um, and that's all of it. So it's a recodification. So because of Justinian Code, we're going to know, we know that the 12 tables last 2,000 years of Roman law, and they last for an additional 3,000 years post-Rome because of uh, Justinian Code, which is going to be the foundation of law code in that region for about another 3,000 years. So 5,000 years is pretty damn impressive. You need to know that his general, Belsarius, his general, Belsarius, this is a test question as well, by the way, Belsarius is the general for Justinian, and because of Belsarius, they're going to recover about 75% of Rome's territory. Why are they trying to mimic Rome? Jake? Yeah, and they have this whole kind of, like the Romans were really Christians. Were the Romans really Christians? No, but at the end, were they Christians? Yes, but like, they're kind of just obsessed with it. The reason why we have so much Roman art is why? The Byzantines are the ones preserving all of it. They're putting it all of it into museums right away, and that's why we have so much in Greek tradition. If you went to go see the art museum, who went to the art museum? I know Morgan was there. Okay, if you went to the art museum on Saturday, weren't you surprised by how many Greek pottery, how many Greek pots there were? Like in Tampa, how weird. Okay, the reason why there's so many Greek pots is because who was super important to the Greeks? Who worshipped the Greeks? Romans. Romans. Who worshipped the Romans? 
So whatever the Romans preserved, because the Greeks, well, the Romans were obsessed with the Greeks, they preserved all the Greek stuff, so that kept them safe. And then the Byzantines protect all the Roman stuff, and the Roman stuff had tons of Greek stuff, and that's why we have all this stuff super well preserved. All right. So you need to know you guys are going to conquer a ton. The Byzantine Empire is going to be overthrown by the Muslims. Just put a little note in. It's going to be the Sassanid that are going to overthrow, in case you care. Assassins, yes, I know we cover them in period two, but they're still kind of limping along here. They're going to eventually be overthrown by the Caliphates, but that's fine. The Ottomans are eventually going to come in 1453. No, Constantinople, Byzantine is going to just come to what we consider modern day Turkey, but most of the other regions are going to be conquered by the Assassin. All right, you do need to know the theme system. The theme system. It's for every new province, uh, the general controls the territory and then gives it to soldiers. The theme system, this is a test question on Thursday, by the way. The theme system is all the providence or all the land territory taken over is going to be given to the general who conquers it. Then the general distributes the land to the soldiers. All the soldiers are coming from the peasant class. So who does this benefit? The peasant class, for sure. The soldiers and the peasants are going to benefit the most from it. Okay? So, if you're not in the military, but you're a good little peasant, and you always make your land mass and all that crap, you get land too. Okay? So, theme system is good for regular people like you and I. Generals are in control. It allows us to still be very centralized. All right, perfect. So the uh, boards, here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the dude who is the golden age of the Byzantines. Who is the golden age of the Byzantines? Good. Ethan. Justinian. Justinian. On your whiteboard, what is the name of Justinian's wife who kept him in power because she was so popular with the poor because she was poor when she grew up. Rod. Theodore. On your whiteboard, what is the name of the general who helped uh, Justinian capture 75% of Roman territory? Uh, who is it, Isabella? Belsarius. Belsarius. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the church Justinian commissioned that Rod studied last night? Isn't it nice? Do you like that we're overlapping with Brennan this week? Yeah. Or yes. do you like it when we're ahead? I like when we overlap. <laughs> no. Well, we're not going to do this often. Uh, I was hoping you were going to go the other way with it. Bobby, what is it? There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name of the recodification of the 12 tables into 312 laws? You need to know that number. No. I used to really teach it, and I used to do a primary source on it. Now I just don't care. I mean, it's not a good what is it, Nathan? Justinian Code. Justinian Code. On your whiteboard, what is the name of the land distribu distribution system where generals get the land and they distribute it to the soldiers who are from the peasant class? Uh, what is it, William? Theme system. Theme system. On your whiteboard, what is the royal color of Byzantium, which will then transition to every other uh, Christian empire, Devin? Purple. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... No, let's go. Okay. You are going to write our next section. Can you not smash my stuff? I'm sorry. <laughs> your next session section is Western Europe. So write Western Europe nice and big in the center. You need to note that it is being ravaged or ransacked by... Uh, Germanic tribes, and the first one we're going to talk about is called the Franks. Franks and Beans, Franks and Beans. So, you need to know it's Western Europe. They're being ransacked by Germanic tribes. The first Germanic tribe we're going to talk about are the Franks. Now, you need to know, the only thing you need to know about the Franks is that they convert to Christianity on their own free will. They convert to Christianity in order to attract more people to follow them. So are they really devout? 
No. They just will say, oh, this is pretty popular. How about I do this? And I'll get more people to follow me. That's all it is. So the Franks, they, uh, where are they located? France. 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 There you go. They're in France. Okay. So now you need to know that the Franks are going to evolve into who we call the Carolinians. The Franks turn into the Carolinians. They're only called the Carolinians when they start centralizing. Okay, so the Franks evolve into the Carolinians. Now, the Carolinians are founded by a guy named Charles the Hammer Martel, which is pretty awesome. Okay, Charles Martel is the founder of the Carolinian dynasty. You need to know that he defeats the Muslims at the Battle of Tours. You need to know that he defeats the Muslims at the Battle of Tours. The Battle of Tours is right on the cusp of modern day Spain and France. Okay? Who do you think was the better military? The Muslims or Charles Martel? Muslims. The Muslims. They have way more money than Charles Martel. They have a larger military. Who can tell me why did Charles Martel win? Think about it logically. They're Muslims, so they come from what region? The Middle East, and they're fighting in Spain and France. Why do the Muslims lose? Why, Jake? Ah, they're too spread thin. Because their empire, look over here, because this is really next week stuff, so it's important for you to understand. The Muslims are obviously going to conquer all of the Middle East, including overthrowing the Byzantine Empire, correct? Okay, then they're going to conquer all of North Africa and down the coastline of uh, number eight, East, East Africa. They're also going to conquer all of Spain and Portugal. How many of you have ever been to Barcelona? Okay, okay, cool. Just How much Arabic influence is there? A ton of it because they were there for 800 years. They conquer all of Spain and Portugal and they start going into France. Look how massive their empire is. Do you think maybe they're a little too strong too thin? That's the only reason why Charles Martel beats them is because they're not in full force because they're too strung out. So he wins. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why you are not of Muslim descent if you are a white European of European descent is because of Charles Martel. Because if he lost, all of Europe would have eventually converted to um, Islam. So, Charles Martel is considered a huge hero at the time. Can we agree? And is celebrated. So, you do need to know that he defeats the Moors and the Muslims in Spain. Now, his son, the grandson, Charlemagne, he is the golden age of the Carolinians. No. Charlemagne is a pretty awesome guy. Charlemagne <coughs> is going to create the first centralized empire in Western Europe post-Rome. He's the first. He also believes in literacy. What is literacy? What is his name? Yeah, he's a huge fan of it. He tries reading his whole life and never figures it out. Because he tried too late. Just couldn't get it, I guess. It's kind of sad. He's the biggest centralized government post Romans. What do you got, Annie? What did you say he was the first one? He was the first centralized government post Rome. Okay, and he also is a huge supporter of literacy. However, he never learns how to read. He really does try. Every day, apparently, he sits there for an hour trying to read. And if someone's there, like, trying to teach him, and he just never figures it out. What? Of uh, the Carolinian Empire. Now, you do need to know that he, Charlemagne, creates the Missi Dominaci. These are government auditors who make sure that Charlemagne's government is not abusing their power. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a very good thing. Okay, so he creates the Missi Dominaci to make sure his government is not abusing their power. What do you got, Jay? No, it's not really a bureaucracy. He's mostly just making sure the government, that the lords and stuff that he has is not taking too much uh, taxes and abusing their power. Okay, so it's a good thing. Now, fun fact, you need to know, that, that just be aware, Charlemagne has three sons. So when Charlemagne dies, 
Okay, he distributes his land equally between his three sons. And all of his sons are like, yes, daddy. That's so nice, daddy. So as soon as daddy dies, the older son and the middle son kill the youngest son. <laughs> and then the oldest son and the middle son fight in a civil war for ten years. So how good do you think the Carolinian Empire is going to look after it's been fighting itself for ten years? It looks like pretty crappy. And that's exactly what's going to happen. So because the Carolinian Empire, which is a massive empire, okay, uh, because they're fighting amongst themselves, it's eventually going to collapse because of civil war. Okay? And the civil war is the division between the three sons. Now, because the Carolinian is weakening for ten years because they're fighting themselves, a group called the Vikings! are coming into power. So, your next major heading is called the Vikings. Now listen here, write down what I tell you because I'm going to move on really quick. So the Vikings. The Vikings have too large of a population to feed. So they have to start raiding Western Europe. Okay? So the Vikings have too big of a population. You need to know this. Uh, the Vikings have too big of a population, so they start raiding Western Europe. Now, the Vikings are a sea nation. They're from Norway. Okay, so they are going to sail their boats uh, throughout the North Atlantic and all that stuff, and they're going to sail their boats and start raiding. Okay, they're pretty good at it. However, after they keep raiding the same cities, what happens to their uh, plunder? Is it a lot or a little? A little. So they're like, well, shit, all of our kids are going to die if we don't steal more food. So what they do is that they start riding their boats down the rivers. And once they get to their location, they take their boats out of the rivers, flip them over, and then they run to the village. They flip their boats over. They rape and just steal everything from the village, and they put it back in the boat. And then they take the boat and they run it upside down, full of food, to the rivers, and then they sail, sitting on top of the food home. Oh my god, it's genius. It is genius, and it is indefensible. No one sees it coming, because they literally come in the middle of the night, and you can't hear them. You don't have to be along a river. They'll run to you. They'll fill their boat, and then they'll run back to the river. So it's super fast, super quick. Because of Viking invasions, governments fail and feudalism begins. Because of Viking invasions, feudalism begins. It's genius. The Vikings are awesome. They realize that they're really good at stealing things. I think we can all agree. It's pretty ingenious. Um, so they no longer start stealing food. They start stealing as nice of stuff as they can get. Makes sense. So... Because of Viking invasions constantly occurring, we create this new government system called feudalism. Now, I have mentioned feudalism to you numerous times over the eight weeks of our time together because when the, when the world collapses because of a zombie apocalypse, what are we all going to fall into? What government style? Feudalism. feudalism. Because it makes sense, it's very basic, and it works. So, let's look over here. Do not write too far ahead of me or it will not make sense. Can you agree? Yeah. Okay, so feudalism. It is a decentralized government completely. It is a decentralized government that is based on rights and obligations. So it is a decentralized government based on rights and obligations. So what does that mean? Okay, there is a title in the feudalism called a serf, they have the right to protection, but obligated to farm. That's what we mean by rights and uh, obligations. So a knight has the right to food and a home, but has the obligation to fight. Does that make sense? That's what we mean by rights and obligations. So everything is based on rights and obligations. Like the king has the right to rule but is obligated to protect all of its subjects. Everything is based on rights and obligations. So, in your feudalistic empire, or feudalistic government, you have a king at the top, then you have your lords and nobles, 
Now, please keep in mind, if you decide to study history, there is a difference between a lord and a noble. But for our AP world, we just kind of group them together. Yes? Which one's technically higher, a lord or a noble? A lord. A lord is higher than the noble, but we're not getting that fancy. You can just put them together. So, it goes king, lords, and noble. Then you have your knights. Then you have your serfs. Now, serfs are tied to the land. We're going to talk about what that means here in a few minutes. They are not slaves. They are not slaves. They're different. And we're going to talk about what that means. Yes, I do know that I wrote this twice. That it goes kings, lords, nobles, knights, and serfs. I know that I wrote it twice. Why did I write it twice? Because I think it's important that you understand how feudalism works. And this little chart really helps you. Okay, so look over here. Stop writing. I'm not erasing my board until Thursday morning. There's plenty of time to write it down. Please look. So, this is what feudalism looks like. You have a king. A king has the best plot of land in the center, okay? Then you have, he has lords that break up all of the rest of his land. The lord has knights and a manor house. That's where the lord lives, correct? Okay? And in this, he has people who are working the land. So a king has a lord here has a lord here, a lord here, and a lord here. The king tells the lord what to do, and the lord then does what the king asks. Decentralized. With that being said, you have certain fiefs. A fief is a piece of land that is farmed. A fief is where serfs work. Remember, they have the right to protection, which is provided by the knights, but they have the obligation of farming. Okay, and that's where they do the farmings on the fiefs. Now, every lord gets their own manor house, and the manor house is the center of government and the economy in this region. So, if you live in this, under this lord, do you ever leave? Mm -hmm. This lord only goes to visit the king and goes back. So, is this very expansive? No. Is there trade coming from anywhere else? No. No. It is literally a small economy going on in between each of these areas. Looking at it, does it make sense why this lasts for centuries? Does it make sense that if the world ends tomorrow, the U.S. government ends tomorrow, this is how it's going to break down? Everyone fights for themselves. Well, no, because I, Kai, do you want me defending you and your family? Well, Am I really what you want for, you know, fighting in the front lines? No. But I need someone to protect me, and the people who are the military need to eat. So it's a perfect exchange of services. I would be a good little farmer. I can keep plants alive. I've always got fresh plants. I'd be a good little farmer. I'd complain all the time. Right? I was going to uh, But I would be a good little farmer. Then, because of that, I would get protection. Who here would be good on the nights? Who would be good at killing people and protecting no one? You're not savages in here? Oh. All right, hell yeah, Colton. All right, Autumn, hell yeah, Autumn, hell yes. Okay, so this is why it's a good default system. If you are watching The Walking Dead, which apparently no one's watching, I don't watch it, they've created a feudalistic society. You have a lord, right, this guy, I don't know what his name is, the guy with the bat, whatever, he created a feudalistic society and all this stuff. What do you got? Okay, no, the Vikings are going to cause chaos, and everyone's scared. Because everyone's scared, they're looking for protection. So that's why they sign things called feudal contracts, and that's the next thing you need to know. So serfs sign a feudal contract that says they get protection in exchange for work. They're only called serfs because they sign a serf uh, feudal contract, which makes them serfs. So, Annie, if you're six generation grandfather forever ago. So some random dude, because you have no idea who that is. Love that guy, because I'm even saying awesome. Okay? That guy signs a feudal contract. Guess what you're gonna be? He's gonna because he signs a feudal contract, he becomes a serf. And six generations here you are, guess what you're gonna be? Yep. Guess what your six generations from you is gonna be? Serf. That's how this whole system works. Nah, yeah. It's all about making sure farmers, uh, people are getting fed, and there's potential. So are there any other rooms? Yeah, I mean, you're going to have some people who are going to be, like, you're going to have, like, your typical Middle Ages society. You're going to have your blacksmith. You're going to have your, 
bread maker, you're going to have your ground house, stuff like that. But essentially for AP World, this is the basic system. What? Are the other people, are they signing other people's contracts? Yeah. Does everybody have to work the government together? They're not working in the government. They're working in the they're working in their piece. They're working on their piece, which is the pieces of land. So is it like For sure. Yeah. And then they would have some people who have certain skills, like the blacksmith is a skill, who would teach his son, and then his son, and then his son, and it's inherited positions. Ah, uh, to a degree. They're not really. I mean, they have a job to do and stuff like that. But as we evolve through the feudalistic society, uh, things get more complex, as we know. What do you got? So if you're like a really good blacksmith, you can be like, not that you can get more money somewhere else. You wouldn't. Okay. You wouldn't know that. Okay. Why would you know that? Because you only live here. Yeah, but like, so you don't no go anywhere else. No, no one's coming. To, no one is going to Western Europe. Does it sound like it's a good time? No, so like people within Western Europe. No, no one's moving. Okay. Everyone is sitting still. Why? Because there's Vikings and they're coming around and killing people and you don't want to leave your little feet them. Okay. Yeah, no one is moving. So this is why people historically have called it the Dark Ages. Is it really dark because no art, no culture, and any of that? No, because things are happening in our monasteries, which is where the church is spending all their money. So a lot of that stuff is happening, but we also have a lot of people just sitting around. Now this ends. Feudalism ends because of the Black Plague. Why? Everybody dies, and all the serfs who survive, they're like, screw you, man. I'm not farming for you. No one else is here. Come at me, bro. You can't do a damn thing about it. Peace. I'm out. And they just leave. And no one can enforce it because everyone's like dead. <laughs> so they're just like, all right, I'm going to go do me. What do you got, Colton? How big were the ships and the Vikings were saying? Oh, like you could hold like 15, 30 people. What? Yeah. They're just like jogging around. <laughs> yeah. It's like 30 of them. 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 I live like in the middle of like rocky terrain. Yeah, like that's exactly what they would do because those are the places, especially as time goes, those are the places that they haven't raided before, which means they're going to have more stuff, right? And they're going to have more stuff that they can steal. It's awesome. The Vikings are amazing. However, the Vikings are going to keep Europe from really growing. Can we agree? Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't the greatest system for culture to flourish. Um, for sure, but it is a very effective system. So if the zombie apocalypse comes, I would try to set yourself up as a lord pretty well. Say, I have a government style for us. Yeah, anyway. Um, so it's like they have the farm. They just have the knights are going to be spread out throughout, and the knights go and do their patrols day and night to keep the Vikings away. Well, if they're outside, yeah, but I mean, like, the Vikings are carrying boats on their heads, so they're not, like, the fastest thing. But, like, there's not that much of, like, threat of fear. For instance, it's the image, the idea of the Vikings is scarier than the Vikings. Because there's really not that many Vikings running through Europe. However, the fact that they can come in super quick, kill and rape everyone, take all the food and leave, is pretty horrifying. So that fear is what's going to keep it. So most of these knights are just sitting around getting fat. Or they're going to the Crusades and sometimes and stuff like that. We have some of that. But. Um, you know, like, like the idea of like the real Vikings with like the reforms on their Yeah, those are the Vikings. Those are. Those are. They have an animistic uh, kind of religion. They believe like in like the Norse lords and all that stuff. Yeah, they believe the strength of like the big animals and all that crap. Now, it's like it's like what you see in like the princess movies, like the little town. And they're, like, the yeah. Town. Yeah, it's not that cute, though. Ugh. Can you imagine? Now, someone was like, last period was like, well, this must make women more important. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, women become less important in feudalism. Why? Are we really great farmers in comparison to a man? No. Are we really great? Someone was like, well, women can be knights, right? Sweetie, what wonderful world do you live in? Because that's the world I'd like to be a part of. No, women are becoming become less valuable, and one of the reasons why we become less valuable is this word that you've probably heard of. It's called chivalry. You need to know. This is the code of conduct of feudalism. Chivalry is the belief that women are dainty flowers, 
and that we need a man to protect us and to provide for us. That if we don't, we can just fall over. This puts women back even further. Wait, so that, that's just about women, nothing else? That men should be men. It should be like, and like defend their wives and their women. And that if you need to save your woman, you just pick her up and throw her over your shoulders and you just take her home. That's chivalry. The belief that a man will always know best. Is that a good thing for women or a bad thing for women? Uh, it's a terrible thing for women. However, uh, for men, it gives them even more power because they can say, well, put chivalry in protecting you. Which is why we have this whole illusion of, you know, Prince Charming on his white steed. It's feudalism. The fact that the Prince Charming at some point always picks up the chick, throws him over the shoulder, and he just marches away while she's sitting there screaming. That whole romantic, and that's what it's called, romantic idea is chivalry. It was right. So when you say, oh, chivalry is dead because a man won't open a door for you, first of all, ladies, he deserves to have the door open for him. It's called kindness, okay? Anyway, so when we say chivalry is dead, everyone in the room should be like, thank God. I mean, it's awful. I don't want to be a dainty farmer. I don't think anyone looks at me and says, oh my God, Samantha Bennett is a dainty farmer. (laughs) But that's essentially what it comes down to, essentially a false (laughs) bullshit. All right, what else do you have? Because feudalism is a huge concept, and we're going to be studying this again. It's going to continue to spread through all of Europe, and it's going to go to Russia as well. Now... This is going to end in Europe in the 1400s. It's going to end in Russia in the 1800s. Yeah, hot damn. So if you ever think about Russia and you're kind of like, why are they kind of like behind? The reason is, is because they're doing feudalism. I don't know if they're that behind. Huh? I don't know if they're that behind when they, you know, like. Well, like their quirkiness and all that stuff. Now, since uh, the Soviet Union, they're going to spear ahead. But the reason why they're kind of in this competition state is because they've been so far. Oh, Annie, you better take that earbud out of your ear right now for sure. Jake. Oh. Yeah. Goodbye. Do we like feudalism at least? Yeah. It's totally interesting.